stood above it looking down with these big red eyes. Oh, it's so scary. What do you want from us, monster? And the monster bent down and said, I need about 350. Uh, oh my god, this is my first time doing it. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Catherine Monk. I'm Kitty Monk's clone. Or sister, I don't know. And I'm here to talk to you about South Park. But actually, I'm lying. What a twist. I'm really Kitty, wearing Catherine's skin, much like Ennard. Don't worry, Catherine is fine like wine. She's really at Ralph's getting ice cream. Okay, hi, I'm Kitty Monk, and I'm here to talk to you about South Park, or more specifically, their twists. I'll be honest, one of my favorite cliches are twists, especially twist endings. That's why I made so many videos about them. Well, that and coincidentally, they are some of my favorite episodes in general, and I need a catchy, attention-seeking title. The problem is, with any twist, you can only really watch the episode, movie, book, billboard, commercial, whatever twice. The first time you just watch it for the heck of it and you get such a high and a gasp when you finally see the twist. The second time you already know what's gonna happen. You're no longer watching it to enjoy it. You're watching to see what you missed the first time. It's like when you get really comfortable at night and then you have to go to the bathroom and you know you're not gonna go back to sleep until you go pee. You'll never feel that comfortable again. Still, South Park in many aspects, has a lot of great twists, which we shall discuss here. No matter how big or how small or how big or long or uncut. So, let's discuss. But like always, we'll begin with the honorable mentions. Okay, this time I have two honorable mentions. You can probably guess what they are. First off is the reveal of City Walk's owner, Twong Lu Kim, and his true ethnic identity. Butters' parents believe that their son has multiple personality disorder, or in modern terms, the did. My viewers, they, they told me this was fine, and I am bound by y'all's opinions. Only, it turns out Butters really is not the one with the mental illness. It's his psychiatrist, Dr. Janice. Take over. Let's play Battleship, all hands on the poop deck. Your soul will bleed for eternity. The horn toad says we should go to Mexico. And as it turns out, his main personality is Tong Lu Kim. Meaning that Kim isn't a Chinese man. He's a white man who thinks he's Chinese. A twist only South Park can do without seeming offensive or racist. Butters wants to get Dr. Janice the help he needs, but the adults figure that if he goes to prison or gets better, there won't be any Chinese restaurants left in town for a while. It'd really be so bad for us to just let him go on thinking he's Lu Kim forever? Now that City Sushi is gone, City Walk is the only Chinese restaurant left in town. <sighs> I understand the struggle. So better to pretend he's Tong Lu Kim for the time being. To be fair, I think it's a really good twist. There's a great degree of foreshadowing with Dr. Janice's name being a reference to a Roman god with multiple faces, and the B-plot is especially funny. However, there's two reasons I put it down as an honorable mention. First off, I already talked about this episode about a month ago, maybe a little over that. Why continue to beat a dead horse? I'm not Jared. The second, they don't really bring it up again in the later seasons. Beyond a quick joke, if you did not watch City Sushi, no big whoop, but still, nobody ever references it. Now, what's the other episode? You probably know. Pinewood Derby. Like City Sushi, I reviewed it recently, and I felt like it wouldn't be fair to include it or rehash my original points. If I did include it, it would probably be number two. Yes, it's among my favorites, but it got beaten out by another great episode. All right, time for the list. Succubus! 
thank you for trying to take my baby. <gasps> oh my god, the first twist I remember. How fun. In Succubus, Chef starts to date a woman named Veronica. Oh, what darling little children. Here she is now. Children, meet my new girlfriend, Veronica. That's nice. I actually kind of like that name. But what? Dating Chef? I thought you hit it and quit it, but obviously more politely than Quagmire, Barney, or Boomhauer. Veronica seems to be the whole package. She and Chef have amazing chemistry, and they sing a cover of There's Got To Be A Morning After. Wow, a lot of adult shows have done it. This show, King of the Hill. However, something awful happens. You ever heard the saying that when you start to date somebody, you start to take after them? Well, the same can be sort of said of Chef. The longer he dates Veronica, the more vanilla he becomes, and the more mundane. His voice starts to Crack. He quits his job as a cafeteria chef to work at an office. Oh my gosh, that's like my ultimate nightmare. Hey, Chef O, we're going to run down to the office supply store and get some leather holders for our pagers. You want to come? You bet. Chef, this place isn't you. And he unwittingly stops spending time with them to either spend time with Veronica or to something more mundane. Now how about I meet you boys after work and we can play ball? Okay. Chef should be here any minute. Dude, he bailed on us. Whenever the boys try to air their concerns to Chef, Veronica cries a river. Grab me, grab me. The reason it's so low is because while it's obviously a twist, there's really no suspense. After all, the title is a dead giveaway. Maybe if they called it something like Chef's Got a Girlfriend or The Woman, I would provide a discussion on how the episode subverts plot lines like this. I hate episodes when one character cries, I've changed, or they try to tell their friends something important about an SO, and they get ignored or called out by everybody, who are out of character for practically no reason than a stupid plot. Looking at you, Patch Boomhauer, and Funeral for a Fiend. If they did a better job of keeping a lid on the whole succubus angle, the episode would be higher. But as it stands, it is still a twist, meaning it deserves a spot somewhere. What, you thought I was gonna rhyme? Well, me not rhyming, there's your twist. Uh, right. Well, whoever you is, you better get your yeah. ready to run, mother yeah. cause you're a damn traitor. And I'll bet you is this little yeah. right here. Yay, the golf kids. Or, oh, I mean, oh, the golf kids. No weird voices, kitty, please. Okay, there's a few twists here and there I could name. I mean, according to the video games, Ferkel's real name is Georgie. We all float down here. And I do like the joke that these nonconformists all have the most normal sounding names. Michael, Pete, Henrietta, Georgie. You don't even think to change your names like Stan did. Is that nonconformist posering? But the ultimate goff twist was in the episode Goff Kids 3, Dawn of the Posers. Henrietta's parents, Harriet, and this guy. Look, I'm too lazy to Google his name or even make one up for him if he doesn't have one already. They haven't been able to tolerate her behavior as of late, and likely with the fact their youngest son is now off in space being a superhero, Mintberry Crunch. They decide to forcibly send Henrietta to one of those rehabilitation camps for troubled kids. I'm not going to any f camp! It's for two weeks, and when you come back, we can talk about earning back some of your privileges. I won't come back because I'll be f dead! Henrietta, be lucky you live in the South Park universe and not the Unwind universe. Not only will they dissect you alive, but you can run away, and you'll have to be on the run for five years. Eh, good thing you know how to drive, unlike me. Now, once again, I thought this episode was going to be a take on the troubled teen industry, where they promise to take care of your wayward, problematic child, and in the process, 
effectively traumatize them for life and or kill them through the power of neglect and abuse. Kind of like St. Olga's from Star Versus, Henrietta's parents had good intentions, and arguably somebody needs to straighten out that girl. But obviously, a camp where you're tortured and humiliated for weeks on end is not going to solve the problem. Henrietta goes to the camp, and instead of it being full of preppy, boring people, wondering if she's a universal blood donor like Mad Max, she's locked in a room for hours on end, like a prisoner. Hello? Somebody let me out of here! You can't treat people like this! Lawsuit until... Afterwards, Henrietta returns home. Oh. My. God. Hey, guys. What the hell have they done to you? Oh my god, Becky, look at the emo. The other goth kids are upset that Henrietta is brainwashed, brain scoured, and mind polished into being an emo. Being emo really all that different from being goth? Join us! No way! Which, in a way, is basically just being a goth, but with more self-angst, different music choices, and colorful clothing. God, P.E. classes for such wannabe posers. I wish there'd just be an earthquake, so we could all die. Ugh, how can she hang out with them? On top of that, they also start to notice that more and more kids, goth or not, are becoming emo. And unlike the vamp kids and the new Hot Topic, there seems to be no correlation. As you can guess, the camp is to blame. We've been put in touch with this camp for troubled kids like you and- What the hell are you talking about? This place gonna fix you and make you a normal child! After Michael gets taken there, we find out- Wait a minute. Emos are plants? So are cosplayers. How else do you think they make those outfits so quickly? And I think I saw somebody dressed as Poison Ivy when I was in Raleigh. Not only that, but the emos want to do what Unity and the Brain couldn't, and take over the world. They promised me when they take over Earth I can have a cabin on the lake and all the steak I can eat. Dude, it's not gonna be steak. Or if it is steak, it'll be Salisbury. I'm sorry. The remaining goth kids, plus the vamp kids, and Edgar Allan Poe journey to the camp, only to discover the first twist. I get you out of here, and then we're gonna burn this whole place down. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid that's not the plan. Ferkel is emo. Don't you see we can't stop them? We might as well join them. Holy crud, what are his parents like? I have questions. Granted, I guess this does make sense. Oftentimes, the ones who are more loud and proud and devout tend to be the ones who stray, since they start to spot the Freds a lot easier. Or they're compensating for something. Ferkel and the groundskeeper try to turn all of them emo, until Edgar Allan Poe lets it slip. No, they're just like ficus plants and vibrating pots. Excuse me? What do you mean? Are you scared? Yes! That's good! Cause you're on, yes I was scared! Okay, as it turns out, there really was no camp for troubled kids. It was just a reality show, kind of like Undercover Boss, which I have a few things to say about this, hence the entry's low rating. First off, I think the next episode they were planning is super hilarious. Tune in again next week when we make a woman from Milwaukee think she's working at a haunted abortion clinic. That's f***ed up. <laughs> but I do have questions about this twist. For example, how many people actually knew? Like, did Henrietta's parents send her there knowing it was a show? What about Michael's parents? Were they trying to scare them, or get paid, or get five minutes of fame? Did the producers tell some of the kids ahead of time just to make it more authentic? Like some of the vamp kids? Or why couldn't the producers tell one or two kids? To make their reactions seem more real? Did you know about this? I have no idea what's going on. Me neither! And what about this scene? <sighs> C. 
still, I want to bring up how emo Henrietta really needed therapy. Like, this girl is just sitting in her room with a razor blade out in the open, harming herself and saying she wants to. Can't you see I'm hurting? I'm sorry I'm such a disappointment. Sorry I'm not the pretty cheerleader you always wanted. And her mom is just like, oh, I don't care. At least you seem much better. Still seem better? Oh, much better. Well, that's more like it. Then again, this woman did not care there were school shootings and even made one up just to trick Sharon into following her on the basis of it being a surprise. Wow, maybe she really is Henrietta's mother. and two dislocated fingers. Oh dear. But I'm more concerned about his state of mind. Your son appears to be completely insane. My name is Jennifer Lopez, and I like tacos and burritos. Well, personally, I only really like tacos, but for the sake of this joke, we are having both. And that rhymes. In Fat Butt and Pancake Head, Carbon does a Jennifer Lopez routine for the Latino Endowment Council. No, no, ja, huh? Ja, ha, ja, ja, Jennifer Lopez. Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> if you're wondering how he wins, look up Speedy Gonzalez. That's all I'm gonna say. He gets a cash prize for it and uses the proceeds to record a music video, which catches the attention of a major record company. This causes Cartman's hand puppet to become famous, as everybody thinks it's a living person, and becomes the new Jennifer Lopez, because clearly she can't just have a stage name. Stuff happens, I'm pretty sure Matt Damon assaulted Cartman's hand, ew. Ben! What is it, sweetie? Ben Affleck is naked in my bed. Ooh, looks like the Tooth Fairy was extra happy with you. And then, when things seem to be going too far, Jennifer Lopez reveals a terrible secret. A lie I cannot continue anymore! I am not Jennifer Lopez! I am... Mitch Connor. Uh-uh. Uh, excuse me? Oh, no, 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 no. I've been a cheat all my life. And now I've ruined a singer's career, lost a record company millions, and cost this little boy his precious time. Ugh, <sighs> whatever. But at least Cartman doesn't have to accept the consequences of his actions. There's no more engagement with Ben Affleck, Jennifer Lopez can't beat his butt, and the real Jennifer Lopez now has to work at a Del Taco. Ow! Look out, muffin head! Uh, look, Miss Lopez, uh, if you're going to be a member of the La Taco family, you're going to have to learn to get along with people. Which, I feel her pain. I went to the one in Vegas, and those fries were so gross. Speaking of, fun fact, this is one of Trey Parker's favorite endings, just because of how ambiguous it was. Is Cartman that delusional? Is he just playing pretend? Did he start it as a joke initially, but he had to keep it up, or felt like he had to? Or did he slowly lose his sanity? Maybe he can't help it. Look, he knows full well what he's doing, and he's just waiting for us to buy into it. Dude, do you really think he would go through all this just to make us look dumb? Yes, dude! Me personally, I find it funnier to think that Cartman is that delusional. He acts similar in other episodes, and we know that he loves to play mind tricks on himself. Jennifer Lopez obviously could have been a joke at first, a joke he forgot he was playing. But as it stands, I'm hungry, so I'm gonna go to the next section so I can have my tacos and burritos. Jimmy, you're thinking with your- I am not thinking with my- Yes, you are. No, I just think that well, she's, a, she's a- She's an emotional, Jim, interesting, caring girl. Jimmy, that's your <laughs> talking. Ah, Leslie, the running gag of season 19. Now, when you were in school, I'm sure your teachers would constantly be like, Stop talking. In middle school, they took away recess for a month straight just because a few kids in our grade would not stop talking when we had to stay inside during stormy weather. But I do believe this takes the cake and overprices it to heck and back. In season 19, there's a running gag where whenever PC principal has an assembly or tries to talk to the kids, he always singles out one girl in particular, Leslie Myers, for supposedly talking to her friends. Understanding we've asked students of Canadian origin to introduce you to their culture and hey Leslie shut your f***ing mouth to introduce you to their culture and customs. Even if she isn't really talking. Today we're going to be showing you some art from our Asian American students and damn it Leslie shut your f***ing pie hole. 
Poor girl. While at first it's just a quick joke and was probably intended as such, Naughty Ninjas reveals a dark secret about her. Part of a plan to take down your beloved town and everyone in it. What? What do you know about a little girl named Leslie? During the next episode, Jimmy is approached by Bar Brady and a group of former newsmen who tell him the reality of the situation. Ads have developed sentience and they intend to take over the world by pricing humans out of everything. <laughs> Duh! We were warned about this! To this end, they've even found a way to look human. As Jimmy can identify ads at a glance, they make him speak to Leslie, who now sounds like she's either disassociating or trying to imitate Siri. I thought I'd recognize him. They told me I was special. Are you special too? I prefer handicapped. Huh. I like that. After a short conversation, Jimmy realizes that... Can you excuse me for a moment? Okay. Well, Jimmy, what do you think? Does she know she's an ad? Yeah, this was a good twist. And nice shirt. It's kind of robotic, I guess you could say. I guess this could also explain why she was always talking. She was trying to convince people to buy stuff. But like usual, I do have the occasional problem with this. So the way Bar Brady discovers what's going on is he's shown a photo of PC Principal and Leslie on a swing. PC Principal later sees this and he starts to have a crisis. And, and when I tried to cancel that, another window came up and it was this. Dude, what the f bro? What does this mean, dude, bro? What the f bro? The thing is, while this explains Leslie, it doesn't really explain PC Principal. The show does try to say that he was being manipulated, but they don't explain it as he was an advertisement that developed sentience and forgot about his origins. Or he was just a normal human, and the advertisements were using his image for their own ends. In which case, holy crap, that last point is pretty scary. But until he had the babies with Strong Woman, the first one just made the most sense to me. It would explain why he just appeared out of the blue and seemed so one note. Considering all of the reveals in PC Principal Final Justice, I think it would have been good if Leslie explained it. Like, you fool, you were supposed to be a pawn and you cost us everything. Every time you block us, we get smarter. Every time you try to stop us, we are more. If one plan fails, we will plan another. Just saying. She really reminds me of Circus Baby. You know what you get, Leslie? You get expelled. <laughs> yes, dude! Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello? Well, hey, Phyllis! Oh, I remember these specials. That really was a crazy year. So was the year before. I totally did not mentally decline at all. I think we all know what happens in the future specials by now. The boys break off their friendships, but all individually stay friends with Kenny. Forty years into the future, excluding Cartman, they're all miserable deep down. Even if they might be successful in their own fields, they peaked in the fourth grade, and they've grown stagnant. Wow. Wow, imagine that. Like, like, I can understand people peaking in high school, but fourth grade, your entire life is ahead of you. Holy crap, they must be like zombies. Kenny dies for reals, and the boys travel back to town for the funeral. Only, it's just the main four. While we do get to see glimpses of the other kids through cameos, there's somebody important that we're missing. Butters. You know, apparently the darling of Matt and Trey. The whole time, I kept wondering, where the heck is he? Maybe he could have brought brevity to the situation, as this special was kinda dark? I even had a Twitter post ready to go that said, I loved this special, but I wish they showed us where Butters was. Then we got the ending, which changed everything. But first, 
context. As an adult, Kenny became a world-renowned scientist who used his money to help improve South Park Elementary. However, he also had various projects on the side, among them his magnum opus, time travel. To get the money needed for such an endeavor, he worked with a backer named Victor Chaus. Only, at the end of the episode, we learn that Victor isn't some random one-time character, like Kathleen Kennedy. His name isn't Chaos. It's Chaos. This is one of my favorite twists. It's one of those rare times South Park took me completely off guard, and I applaud them for it. And I like how it's foreshadowed. And I like the foreshadowing. See, I watch shows almost exclusively with the closed captions on. It's the only way I can understand what they're saying, and hey, it's how I learned about grammar. In the closed captions, the name is spelled Chaus, as in C-H-O-U-C-E, not chaos. I don't know if it was intentional or what, but I like it. Don't feel like talking, huh? <laughs> you will. Plus, it makes total sense for Butters to pronounce Chaos as Chaos. Beyond it being his most frequent persona, Chaos could also be a fancy way of him pronouncing the word Chaos. And as the next special showed, Butters was trying his damnedest to distance himself from his past life. I think this would be the easiest way to do it. On top of that, even if Butters tried to move on, he still considered the boys his friends, and he enjoyed hanging out with them. It likely devastated him that they weren't as close as they once were. And as Butters got locked up for years thanks to the shutdowns, I'd imagine that he also has personal reasons for helping Kenny. I don't know. Hey, you guys want to buy NFTs? What are you talking about? Dude, Ike isn't dead. He's in Nebraska. What, what, what? Hey, buddy. It's a top ten list guy. Let's do it, Fwen. Huh, Ike. When you combine his name with Kyle's, it forms a horrible slur. Ike has had many amazing episodes where he's essentially become Maggie Simpson 2.0, but he keeps his childish innocence and genius knowledge. The thing is, this wasn't always the case. During Ike's Wee Wee, Gerald and Sheila want to host a brisk for Ike. It's Jewish tradition, Bubby! Normally we do it right after the baby is born, but we had to do it later for Ike because he's a- ah! Keep this in mind going forward. The boys, back when they actually acted like children, misunderstand what happens at a bris and believe that Ike will be castrated. They're gonna chop off his wee-wee! Chop off his wee-wee? Are you sure? Yeah, dude! It's a Jewish tradition! It's called a circumcision! Which is odd that Kyle doesn't understand he's Jewish. You think even if he hasn't been to one, somebody would have told him what happens, be it a rabbi or a moyle. And Sheila is all about explaining things to children in ways that they would understand. I could see her having told him at least once, or trying to. I mean, just to ready him for what he's gonna see. Yeehaw! Cover me for a while. I'll find a place to hide him and come back. No way, dude. We're not staying alone in your house with your wee-wee chopping parents. Just give me 30 minutes. Come on, Ike. Me, me, mama. I I'm gonna take him up to the bathroom to get washed up. However, the doll is destroyed and his parents presume that Ike is dead. And his funeral, Kyle notices his brother's headstone is odd. Ike wasn't really your brother. He was adopted. What? He was not really a Braslovsky. He was Canadian. But we loved him all the same. You mean to tell me that all this time I've been trying to protect Ike from having his fireman cut off and he's not even my real brother? Look, adopted or not, he is still your brother, Kyle. Stop kicking him like a football. What's great about this twist is, compared to most others on this list, hey, that rhymes, it becomes a plot point throughout the show, and a huge part about Ike's identity. Like, in the movie, Ike has to hide in the attic when the Canadian War begins, and Kyle tries to appeal to his mother by saying that her own son is Canadian. Another episode had Ike's birth parents come into the pitch 
Fletcher and try to take him back. Or that Kyle presumes Ike went through puberty so quickly because he's Canadian. Or heck, that one episode where he goes all the way to Canada and becomes a knight just to save the princess. It's also nice to see that, as an adult, Ike ended up going back to Canada, but keeps in close contact with his family, even distributing some Boxing Day presents. And what makes it more interesting is this whole twist and this whole character trait, this was not planned. Yes, you heard that right. At the start of the show, Ike was written as a full-blooded American and a Proflosky, which means he was also a day walker, but not a New Jerseyan. The reason Ike looks like Pac-Man was because originally, all South Park babies were meant to look like that. It was really nothing special. However, then Terrence and Philip were introduced. While they were originally British, they were later retconned into being Canadian and the writers follow suit by making all other Canadians resemble them, and this included Ike. So, great on them, buddy! I don't know what's wrong with some people. I wonder if anyone else thought that this kid's name was Token. Huh? Anybody? Anyone else just assume? I know! <laughs> How disgusting! And part of the problem. During 2020, there was a lot of discussion about replacing voice actors with people of color. If the character in question was a person of color and they were voiced by a white person. If you want to know my thoughts on this, I'm kind of like reviewed to death. I try to approach things case by case. Like, I don't think they should replace Toby Huss on King of the Hill, but I do appreciate how Family Guy, Big Mouth, or even Veggie Tales handled these changes. South Park is no stranger to controversy, so this episode was created. Token himself was voiced by Adrian Beard, because he was the only black crew member. However, Token's father was voiced by Trey Parker. I wanted to name my son after my favorite author, but she didn't want to name our son J.R.R., so we just named him Token. Which, again, I don't mind, as he doesn't appear that often, and it's a plot point that Token's parents are massively out of touch. That is, until... Well, y'all came to the right business, cause this <laughs> is hard. Oh! Oh, he didn't even talk like that before! This guy's a total phony! What a twist! Wait, does he really sound like that? Or was he just code switching to make his business better? Just saying, he does speak that way in later episodes even when he doesn't have to. However, this twist aside, there's another larger one we have to discuss. The truth about Token. Randy learns that Black-owned businesses sell better, especially nowadays. And as there aren't any other Black families in town besides Token's family, <sighs> thank you, Mr. Garrison, and your hintings, and Nicole is not a character this week, he forces Stan to invite Token and his family over for dinner. Check out our friends! I hope you didn't invite us here because we're black. It's just that the past year or so, a lot of people have been inviting us over to dinner and than taking pictures of us to show everyone on Instagram. Only rather than having a nice dinner, Randy just has to pry until we learn the awful truth. Token's real name is not Token. It's Tolkien, like J.R.R. Tolkien. His name is Tolkien? Yes, you know his name is Tolkien. I thought your name was Tolkien. My name is Tolkien. I'm sorry, I don't think it's that weird. I mean, ugh, come on. What couple would name their child Token? As in, the Token Black Child. That is just an awful microaggression. I mean, no Jewish person would name their daughter Menorah. And as it turns out, pretty much everybody else knew. They just either misspelled it or mispronounced it. Did you know that Token is named after J.R.R. Tolkien? Well, yeah, I just figured. Then why did you spell it Token without the L or the I? J.R.R. Token has an L in it? And it would have been fine if it was left at that. That's a funny enough twist as is. But this is Sal Park, so they go a step further. Stan feels upset that everybody is shaming him for being racist. Even if I don't think he really is, he made like one mistake, guys. And it's a pretty minor one at that. Just apologize, try not to do it again, and move on. Then I suggest you start doing a lot of reading. And I suggest that when you're reading, you do it from the perspective of a black person. Stan tries to be supportive by not personally apologizing to his supposed friend or asking him directly how he can make this better. I think maybe we all haven't done enough to make sure that Tolkien doesn't feel isolated and left out. 
Guys, can I come in now? Not yet, Token, just another couple minutes. <sighs> you don't get it, Stan. And I don't think you get that you don't get it. Instead, he pushes for J.R.R. Tolkien curriculums and awareness and invites Tolkien up to talk. Just because my dad's into that stuff doesn't mean that I am. I've always hated that my name is Tolkien. But I didn't really have a choice, did I? So please, whatever you do, just don't draw any more attention to my name. Burn. Wait, viewers from groups that I try to bring awareness to. Am I being a stan? I'm just trying to include everybody for the sake of fairness. Speaking of, I think I might have mentioned it before, but I like to think that to make things funnier, Tolkien always preferred being called Token. Or maybe he didn't mind Tolkien until he saw Lord of the Rings. He even says in the same episode that he hates his name, which... I feel you, kid. My real name sucks as well. Maybe he didn't make the connection of his name being a racist pun. This whole time, I thought your name was Token. Like, the token black person. Wow. And you know what? I'll take this a step further. What if everybody else was as clueless as Stan, but because the town is trying to be politically correct, they keep pretending like, oh yeah, oh yeah, we always knew. Named after J.R.R. Tolkien? Yep. Yeah, I knew that. Why else would his name be Tolkien if it wasn't for the guy that wrote the books? People tell me, oh, you're looking too deeply into this, but remember Tweak x Craig and how everybody acted there? I could see them repeating this. What makes this twist great is the multiple layers to it. Of course, this twist was just created out of the blue. Again, I think the whole purpose of this episode was to introduce the integrity conflict and also to change voice actors for Token's father. But as the episode has the joke of, if you thought Token's real name was Token, you're a disgusting racist. So the crew continue to gaslight us. Apparently, even the closed captions for that episode has everybody say Tolkien except for Stan and his family. On top of that, the crew went back and edited Tolkien's name in video games, the wiki, merchandise. I know some people said closed captions also count, but I watched South Park to fall asleep with the captions on, and I've never seen it. Unless maybe it's somewhere like HBO Max. Oh no, maybe I really do have a problem. How do I fix it? I made some chili to enter into the contest. What contest? This is a chili cook-off, ain't it? Huh? Oh, yeah, I guess it is. It's my special recipe. God gentlemen! Okay, before we begin, I have to ask y'all a question. Raise your hands if you read Titus Andronicus. Really? Nobody? <sighs> okay, well how many of you watched that one episode of Game of Thrones? <laughs> of course, none of y'all appreciate one of Shakespeare's lesser works. It's so good and so influential. Cartman, while notable nowadays for being Cartman, a genocidal, violent fourth grader, was not always like this. Early on, he was just a super bratty kid with a mom who spoiled him to death. That was until the episode, Scott Tennerman Must Die. Cartman tries to jumpstart puberty by buying pubes from a teenager named Scott Tennerman, only to learn that that's not how puberty works. <laughs> Cartman, you are so goddamn stupid, it's unbelievable. You're telling me these pubes are worth nothing. Yeah. And that he was scammed and he looks ridiculous. He tries to do whatever to get the money back, outside of simply going to Scott's parents or his own mother. Eh, I get it. Sometimes you gotta do these things on your own. It gives you a sense of pride. Whatever scheme Cartman cooks up, Scott is always one step ahead of him. Or he can't just leave well enough alone and rubs his victory in Cartman's face. My parents give me a $50 a week allowance. This pittance means nothing to me. Watch. What? What are you doing? Carbon tries to come up with the perfect plan to get revenge on Scott. His initial idea is to train a pony to bite off Scott's wiener. Come on, good pony. That's it. Now bite it off. Bite off the wiener, good pony. Oh, no, pony, he'll like that. Noble, but I have a criticism or two that Jimbo echoes. You've got to think like a hunter. What do you mean? Step one, 
find someone's weakness. Step two, exploit that weakness. Too bad that he and Ned have to give him advice that I live by. Get revenge on somebody by finding out their weakness, which in Scott's case happens to be the band Radiohead. You know that band that sings that song. I'm a creep, I'm a winner. What am I doing here? Oh Jesus, don't start singing, Ned. Oh my god, that one song everybody sang it for karaoke. This leads up to a chili con carnival, where Scott plans to serve Cartman some chili, laced with down their hairs. <gasps> like the McDonald's by my house! Too bad. I have something to tell you. What? You mean about how you put pubes in your chili? What? Cartman, what are you doing? It's delicious, Chef. I hadn't planned on that. What I did plan on, however, was that my friend Stan and Kyle would betray me and warn you that the Chili Con Carnival was a trap. As it turns out, Cartman knew all too well what Scott was planning, and he made sure Scott's parents could not intervene in the conflict. How, you might ask? Personally, about your parents' demise. And of course, feed you your chili. Do you like it? Do you like it, Scott? I call it... Mr. and Mrs. Tenerman Chili. Keep in mind, all this kid did was embarrass Cartman and steal his money. Like $10. I can get being angry. I can get wailing on him. Or TPing his house or egging him or anything like that. But feeding a child to his parents, that's a little too far. Back then. Nowadays, I could totally see him doing it. I mean, look at what he did to Super Nanny. Eh, at least the twist was great and built up all episode. I applaud you, writers. Eight years old is a little late to be considering abortion. Well, I think you need to keep your laws off of my body. Hmm. All right, this is two entries. The first occurs in Kyle's mom is a dirty slot. Yes, it's always slot. She goes down to AC and plays the penny games. Cartman begins to wonder who his real father is and tries to press Leanne for details. She tells him it's Chief Running Water, having hooked up with him at the Drunken Barn Dance. Clever title. But upon visiting him, Cartman learns that the Chief is not his father. Leanne was too drunk to remember and slept with everybody with a pulse and a wiener. All anybody knows is that Cartman's father was somebody who went to the drunken barn dance. And considering his mother and her tendency to spread eagle, that means it could be literally any male in town. So you see, Eric, anyone here could be your father. I'm afraid you're never going to know. The only way Cartman will know for sure is by doing a paternity test. So, episode ends. About four weeks pass, one Terrence and Philip episode later, and stuff happens. Where we learn that Cartman's father is Leanne. What? Yes, it's true. No, that doesn't make sense. Yes. It took quite a while for me to understand as well. Eh, acceptance. As it turns out, Leanne has both male and female organs, meaning she can't get pregnant. Instead, she got another woman pregnant, and said woman gave the baby to Leanne. I'm sorry I never told you, Eric. I just thought maybe it would be a little shocking to you. Oh, well, gee whiz, you think so, ma? But as Cartman is too exhausted from the ordeal, he's fine letting bygones be bygones. Ah, forget it! Speaking of, I like the other twist in the episode that Leanne seemingly wants to have a 40th trimester abortion, and when she learns it's obviously illegal, she starts to sleep all the way up to the president to make it happen. Cartman, I'll legalize 40th trimester abortion for you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Only, it turns out she got the words confused. I meant the other thing you can do. What's that other A word? Adoption? Yes, that's what I mean. Adoption. Well, that's pretty different. Eh, whatever brings for progress. A few years later, well, more like 10 years later, we got the 202 parter. Mitch Connor lets it slip that the adults in town are lying to him about his father's identity. Then I guess I won't tell you about your father. You know nothing about your dad, right? I know enough. You really still believe that garbage? The people in your town sold you that land. Wait, does this mean Cartman always knew deep down or suspected something but just couldn't air his grievances? Come on, you've had to have doubted it all along. 
After doing some sleuthing, he is captured by Scott Tennerman and the Ginger Kids, who does a much better interpretation of Batman the Killing Joke than Batman the Killing Joke. Revenge is a dish best served. Chili. Scott Tennerman. After a tiny bit of torture, Scott lets it slip that... Jack Tennerman was your father. You killed your own father, and then you fed him to your half... Brother. Yeah, so in reality, Cartman's father was Jack Tennerman, a Denver Bronco, and the entire town pulled a rusty Shackleford to protect the team during their winning football season. And everyone here covered it up to protect the Bronco name! They were having a really good year, there couldn't be any distractions! But they couldn't just wait to tell him until after the season ended? Like, maybe just pull him aside, or I don't know, it would be- come on, you can't just lie to this kid. Still, many people don't like this, considering it a retcon. And honestly, I hate to say this, but not every retcon is inherently awful. Come on, Ike being Canadian was technically a retcon. To me, if it makes sense compared to what we've gotten, or it's enjoyable on its own merits, I'm willing to make excuses, or let it slide. And I like this twist much better. It provides an excellent bit of karma to Cartman. Yeah, dude, we, we know what it means. My dad was a ginger! <laughs> Wait, what? Plus, considering how close-minded people could be in the 90s, you think it would be an open rumor that Leanne had two working parts. you. I didn't do anything to your favorite toy, and I'd do anything to get to the bottom of it. So then, we are all going to need some more tea. Okay, Pinewood Derby aside, I'm pretty sure this is my all-time favorite South Park twist. I've even thought about giving it its own review, and I might one day. It depends. Really, what am I doing that week? Stuff like that. In the episode, the South Park 4th grade class takes the presidential fitness test. Oh, fudge. Is that still a thing? I hate it running. And because Cartman is a student, and he is also one gross gorgito, and the test is taken as a group, the entire school fails, and they get the lowest national average. That it actually brought your entire school's average down to the lowest in the country. <laughs> Therefore, they lose recess privileges in order to do gym class in the meantime. <laughs> Like usual, Cartman refuses to apologize or take responsibility, and is ridiculed by the other kids for being immature. That's what we mean by grow up, dude. Stop being a baby. Yeah, why don't you go home and cry to your stuffed animals again? <gasps> <laughs> Admitted, you've all done this at least once. Really? No? Only me? Carbon stuffed animals are able to assage him. Massage him? One of those two? What do you mean, Peter Panda? You didn't make that stupid presidential fitness test. Obama did. Yeah, that's right, Eric! But shortly after, Carpen comes home to a foul sight. Please, I implore you, if you are squeamish, cover your eyes. Fun fact, Clyde Frog had his own show of 28 episodes, which aired on PBS way back in the day. Maybe they held a funeral for him after the cancellation? Clyde Frog was the perfect friend. He never said anything. He never had his own ideas about what he wanted to do. He just sat there going along with whatever I wanted. Shortly thereafter, Cartman's asleep when... Ah! Mom! Mom, my room is... I thought he was supposed to stay gold. So as it seems, somebody really is trying to kill Cartman. And really, it could be anybody. Obviously, it's one of the students, not a grown-up. Except maybe Leanne. Well, all I'm saying, Eric, is that- Sweetie, you really can just talk to me if you- All I'm saying, Eric, is that you went through your mom's diary for a reason. 
but I'm pretty sure that outside of the gym teachers, all the other teachers are probably loving that they no longer have to do recess duty. But which student? That's what we need to figure out. Carbon goes to stay with Token in the meantime, for no other reason than... Token, please. You're the only person I can trust. Because in today's time, black people are somehow incapable of doing anything wrong. Eh, can't argue with that logic. All is fine until later that night, when an intruder breaks in. Let's go, man, Mark! Ah! Fun fact, that's Mark Jacobs. He designed Summer's Top, and the reason they included him is because in real life, he has a Clyde Frog tattoo, and one of Rumper Tumskin. Wonder what he thought about this episode. More and more of Cartman's stuffed animals are murdered until... Why did you do this? It's okay, Eric. It's over now. Wait, what? You burned Peter Panda! Yes, they're gone! And now we can grow up and be together! They were your friends! They were holding us back! Alright, so as it turns out, Cartman was behind all of this. He was trying to mature, like his friends told him to, and to do that, he had to give up his stuffed animals, rather than just put them in the basement or give them to Goodwill. Not Salvation Army, I heard they suck. Meaning, the only way he could do this was by having one final game and destroying them as much as he could. Hold on, so this means that he burned down his house while he and his mom were sleeping. <laughs> Alright. Alright. Goodbye, Polly Pissy Pants. I love you. Holy f <laughs> this kid is insane. The reason I enjoy this twist so much is, well, there's a lot of reasons. First off is the misdirection. We know everybody hates Cartman. They could not have picked a better candidate. Sure, everybody was bored at the funeral, but wouldn't you be? You didn't know Clyde Frog. They probably just figured he would cry and get over it. Speaking of, there is a subplot of sorts where a group of upperclassmen end up wishing death upon Cartman for making them all suffer. He's in your class, but you don't deal with him. So we are gonna remedy the situation. We've got big plans. Just stay out of our way and let the men handle this. Only for it to turn out they weren't really gonna hurt him. They were simply going to protest. Here we go! Hey, what are you fifth graders doing? We are the 83%! We are tired of being punished for the fourth grade class! Which is basically what Jimmy and Butters were also doing. Huh, pretty big of them. Of course, every mystery needs a good red herring, so thank you, boys. Finally, I just find it super unique even if apparently this whole episode is a parody. So that was disappointing to learn. An episode about Cartman having one final round with his stuffed animals, that has a lot of potential. Rather than just saying goodbye to them individually or hugging them, he does this. And it makes perfect sense. Remember the time he could not catch Butters during a game of Border Guard, so he joins the real Border Patrol? Imagine that, but with stuffed animals. My little Eric can sometimes be a bit dramatic. <laughs> <sighs> Understatement to the max, Lee Yan. Control that child! Gondona? Yeah! Alright, then let's get to work. Say, so you don't have $3.50 on you, do you? 